Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm very pleased to be hosting today's discussion on the Campaign for a Better Business Act. Uh, this campaign has been described as an attempt to put people, places, and the planet on a par with profits. Uh, but to be more precise, it's really pushing for the UK's Companies Act to be amended so that businesses are legally required to operate in a way that benefits not just their shareholders, but their workers, customers, communities, and the environment. Uh, and I have to say there was a time not very long ago when this may have sounded like some uh, egregious form of woke capitalism that no sensible business could support. But in fact, more than 600 businesses have signed up to support the campaign since it was launched at the end of March. And they include John Lewis, Danone, Iceland, Innocent Drinks, and many more. Uh, a number of MPs are also backing the move as are bodies such as the Institute of Directors. So we're going to spend the next 55 minutes or so looking at why we need a Better Business Act and what might change if we had one. Uh, we have a very, very exceptional panel of speakers to begin the discussion, and we will be taking your questions and thoughts and ideas as well. So do please send them in via the Q&A box on your screen. So let me now introduce our panel. We have Amy Clark who is co-founder and chief impact officer of Tribe Impact Capital, a wealth management firm that uses the UN Sustainable Development Goals to guide its investments. Roger Barker is director of policy and corporate governance at the Institute of Directors. And Alex Ma is head of regulation and sustainability at Bulb, the green energy supplier. So let me just kick off by asking each of you to quickly explain why each of your organizations decided to support the concept of a better business act. Amy, can you start first, please? Mm, yes, thanks, um, Polita. Well, um, it's pretty clear from the last 18 months, if not the last 10 years, but specifically the last 18 months, that there is a growing litany of environmental, social and governance related issues out in society that really do need to be tackled. Um, and in order for us to be able to tackle them, we need business to be at its very best. And if we need business to be at its very best, then we need the investment community to be at its very best um, in order to support this transition. And as an investor, we're constantly looking for the businesses that are the most likely to perform well. And given all these challenges, these social, these, these environmental and these economic challenges that are out in society, in order for us to better identify those businesses, um, we have to work really, really hard to understand where they are, what their characteristics are, um, and whether they are already creating the future that we need or whether they're likely to be able to create the future through a transition pathway. In the absence of any regulation or policy or standardization or, or normalization in terms of the business models, it actually becomes really, really hard for us to do that sometimes. Um, and as a result, you get different approaches in the marketplace, in the investment marketplace. You often get bifurcation, I think, between those who actually understand what constitutes good business and those who possibly don't understand or those who resist a notion of good business. So from an investment point of view, the Better Business Act is almost like a rising tide that raises all boats to a common standard that makes our jobs easier uh, in terms of identifying the best opportunities. And when you consider that as an investment community, we have vast swathes of other people's capital out in the marketplace. So we have a fiduciary duty to manage that with prudence um, and prudence means identifying those businesses that are genuinely creating the future that we need. So a Better Business Act plays beautifully into a suite of toolkits. It's probably one of the biggest system uh, levers that we have that can help the investment industry perform to its very best, um, as well as businesses perform to their very best as well. So from an investment point of view, to be brutally honest, and I do hate this expression, you know, it is a little bit of a win-win situation having a BBA, okay. you know, uh, come into force. Right. All right. Um, well, from a corporate governance perspective, Roger, um, why has the IOD decided to support? Yes. If, well, if you were to come to the IOD and you were to take our role of the director and the board course on how to be an effective director, one of the first things that you would look at are Gen, uh, directors' general legal duties as defined in the Companies Act, of which the most well-known, the most prominent is Section 172 of the Companies Act. 
And what that is doing is it's, it's, it's telling directors to put shareholders first. That, that is the essence of what the Companies Act is saying to directors. And the problem, though, is if we want directors, if we want companies to address the climate emergency, if we want them to, to take forward the transition to net zero, and also if we want um, companies to fulfill a social purpose, which is increasingly, I think, the expectation of, of society, then we have to change and align those legal duties of directors to be able to fulfill that. Otherwise, we're just really asking directors to, to manage companies with one hand tied behind their backs. You know, society pulling directors in one direction, the companies act pulling directors in the other. And it, it's really about aligning all those things so that we, we're moving forward in, in a way which I think society is now demanding. Okay. Um and Alex, does that chime with you or did Bulb have other reasons for deciding to support this campaign? Um, well, I, I, it builds on a lot of what um, Roger and Amy had said, but so Bulb is um, a B Corp, um, which means that we've already made change and we've been a B Corp since we were set up. So we've made changes to our governing documents that kind of reflect the changes advocated in this act. I and just, I mean, just, sorry to interrupt you, but I, and I'm sure the audience is um, completely well versed in what a B Corp is, but for the few who may not know, um, would you like just to, to explain what certification as a B Corporation actually means? Yeah, of course. So certification, there's over 500 B Corps in the UK now, and certification requires two things. It means changing your governing articles so that you say that um, kind of as, as as Roger said, you make decisions not just in the interest of shareholders, but also um, uh, customers and the, the wider environment. Um, and then you also have to go through, there's a kind of rigorous impact assessment certification process that looks at not just what you do as a business, but how you do that. Um, and you're assessed on that every three years. The standards on that aren't, aren't set. They ratchet up. Um, Bob's just coming up to our next one um, imminently. Uh, and so it, it's it's a really great combination of making sure that change is like built into how you run a business, um, but it also like as in that kind of that core governance piece, but also what you do and how you make those decisions day to day. Um, we also find that like as a B Corp, it's a really, it's a public thing. Um, so our, our members, our customers know about it, our employees know about it, and it's helped us hire good employees, but it also means like our employees hold us to a certain level of scrutiny, hold our directors, our entrepreneurs to our, who are entrepreneurs and are out in front of the company, you know, every Friday at our team meeting, they're not remote. Um, well, we're all remote now, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, so in a sense, if the Better Business Act were to be introduced, it would really require all companies in the UK to behave more like B Corp companies. Is that correct? Yeah, that's the that's 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 the that's the change it's trying to push. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's really and so, and so for Bulb, um, it made sense because you'd already decided to embrace the B Corp um, strategy and go for certification there and um, Tribe as well as a B is a B Corporation, Amy. Um, I just wonder though, Roger, I mean, do you ever hear people saying, well, you know, this sounds great, but isn't it just going to mean a whole lot more red tape because the amendment as drafted um, to create the Better Business Act does require a little bit more reporting um, than is currently done or currently required. So is, is that a potential problem, do you think? I don't, I, no, I don't think it's so much red tape because, you know, companies already have to report on Section 172. But what an oft-heard um, potential criticism um, is it's going to create a lawyer's charter. You know, so we're now going to have the employees, trade unions, all sorts of other NGOs and interest groups, they're all going to be suing the directors because the directors aren't, you know, taking into account their interests. And um, actually that, that isn't the case because, uh, you know, these duties, these general legal duties of directors are actually owed to the company. And it's actually only the company that can take legal action um, against directors for, for breaches of them. So, I mean, this is one of the reasons why Section 172 is actually criticised a lot nowadays, because very few directors actually face legal um, sanctions or legal problems as a result of failing to, to um, deliver Section 172. So I think if you, if you change sec Section 172 now in the way that we're, we're proposing, um, it's 
to some extent, the, the effect will be largely symbolic, I would say. You know, it's not actually going to overnight suddenly create um, a, a massive change in, in behaviour in and of itself um, from companies or, or liabilities or legal actions. But nonetheless, I think it, symbolically it still would be very important because it's, it's kind of the DNA, so to speak, at the heart of company law. You know, what actually are companies there to do? You know, what are directors there to do? And just to make that symbolic change would be incredibly important. Then, of course, then I think you'd have to begin a whole new task of thinking, well, um, what are other areas where its shareholders are, are making the key decisions? Do we need to think about other stakeholders now in, in respect of, you know, who appoints the board of directors, who appoints major transactions and things like that? But as a, as a very symbolic starting point, I think it would be important. Yeah, yeah, that, that's really very interesting points there that you make about those appointments. Amy, I, I'm just wondering, um, you know, could, do, do you have any sort of tangible or concrete examples that come to mind um, it, when it comes to thinking about what difference on the ground the Better Business Act would make for investors? Uh, well, we've, um, when, just to, to add to what Roger said as well, and just the, the previous question, just because I think it segues quite nicely into, into the question you just asked me, Felisa. Um, the Better Business Act is seeding the conditions um, that will enable directors to do their jobs better, recognising the total suite of risks that a business faces, and as a result, the total opportunity set from addressing those risks that is then presented. I think when we're only ever focused on, um, as the Americans would say, the mighty greenback, when we're only ever focused on, on kind of the profit, then we're missing those risks out in the marketplace from changing consumer sentiment, from rising environmental risk and potential regulation, from growing levels of inequality. You know, we're missing all of these big risk areas that can fundamentally change the future success profile of a business. Um, and more recently, very well known. Um, I would imagine a lot of people on, on this um, webinar have you know, read about this, have heard about this. You know, we've seen a small activist fund, engine number one, go right into the heart of Exxon, gather up the other investors um, and shift governance at that business, getting three new directors on the board because they are concerned about the level of future fitness within Exxon and the level of risk that that business therefore is facing. So this is really at the heart of the Better Business Act. It's about good business and good business is about good risk management and good opportunity enhancement. Yeah, and, and it, that's it, a, great, a, a great point that you make about Exxon um, and engine number one. I mean, uh, do you actually need an act like this though to, I mean, you obviously don't really need an act like this to, um, for investors to behave in the way that they have, or do you think that the act could somehow make it easier for those investors to make a move like that at a company like Exxon? Yeah, I mean, I would, I, I'm, I'm sure you, everybody on this call feels the same way. I would love to think that every investor out there has got the same sort of attitude of engine number one. <laughs> Unfortunately, we know that they don't. Um, and you know, there is there is real diversity in an investment approach to these types of issues out, out in the marketplace. I think BBA um, again, you know, it, it creates those conditions for a rising tide that lifts everybody to a standard. Um, where the investment community can then add real value is in driving us way beyond that standard, you know, increasing the level of kind of performance that we get from these businesses as well. We know that consumer sentiment is, is shifting. For, so uh, research that was done in May 2020 with the UK public looking at BBA over 70 or well, over three quarters of the UK public who were polled were very supportive of this. So we know that there's consumer demand out there for this type of change to happen in, in business. We know that employees are now looking for, to work for companies that have a sense of real mission and purpose and responsibility. So we know, as Alex has said, you attract talent by doing this. Um, we know that from research done in November 20, um, that the B Corporation community using that as a bit of a proxy here um, for um, what BBA can create. Um, we know that we have um, grown faster. Uh, we know that we've been able to ride through the last 18 months of the COVID crisis. And actually, this is 
also demonstrated in, during the last economic crisis, 2008-2009, with research that came out of the US B Corporation movement saying that the B Corporation movement itself was more resilient, you know, the businesses were more resilient to these shocks in the system. So there's enough evidence out, I mean, I could go on, but there's enough evidence out there to say that uh, moving away from a voluntary approach to a regulated approach that sets a lower common standard that everybody has to meet is going to benefit everybody ultimately and also create hopefully and unleash a wave of economic growth that is sustainable that supports this build back better um, you know um, a journey that we need to go on um, and that ultimately will create the future where everyone and everything can thrive so for me, it's kind of a less of why would we do BBA? The question is, is why wouldn't we do the BBA? Mm, yeah. Um, actually, we've had a question just come in now, Amy, that um, uh, just follows on from that. Uh, and and the, the question is asking um, about the fact that this proposal shifts the director's role to be creating the benefits for all stakeholders rather than just investors, doesn't it? And, and so um, it's restating the success criteria and definition of purpose of the organization. Do you, do you all agree with that? That's exactly right. It is indeed mm. doing that. And yeah. uh, you know, the, in general terms, directors have a, a duty which is to promote the success of the company. You know, but what does the success of the company mean? You know, in, in current company law, the success of the company is conceived of as being synonymous with the success of shareholders. Hmm. So, well, what this is doing is actually saying, well, actually, the success of the company is something um, more diverse. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's about actually promoting the interests of all relevant stakeholders. Hmm. So yeah. I think it's still it's, it's, it's a key piece of um, regulation. Hmm. Yeah, 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 I think Palitra, it, it kind of reflects this really uneasy relationship that I think the business has had with society and the environment for decades. Um, in that we've had this this paradigm, I think that um, healthy business will create healthy society, and that's the wrong way around. Healthy society and healthy environment leads to the conditions that create healthy businesses. So we have to kind of change this this mindset, change this, this de dependency almost that has been coded into the system and, and move to this sense of aligned stakeholder interests where healthy communities, healthy society, a healthy ecosystem, a healthy planet is what drives successful business. And that's that's the pivot that the BBA is attempting to is uh, you know to create right yeah. in the heart of company law. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Alex, you wanted to come in, I think. I was just going to say, I think what Amy uh, said about um, it enables directors to do their job better because they can be aware of social and environmental risks. I think the other side of that is that the big problems facing us right now, the climate emergency, social inequality, like they, we need businesses, entrepreneurs, enterprise to help solve them. We know that um, government is not, whether it ever was, going to be able to do that on its own. Um, so businesses, you know, like Bulb and like I'm sure many of the businesses Amy invests in are moving into that space already. Um, this kind of codifies that, I suppose. And then that also creates that, that rising tide that Amy was talking about. So I think that's the other, um, the other, the other side of this, that it, 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 it changes the expectations of business and makes it, um, it should be, this should be the norm, I mm. suppose businesses yeah. are around yeah. to try to solve these kind of problems um, and then that's standard you shouldn't have to kind of have to justify that to a shareholder or or anybody else. Yes. So so uh, whenever I have discussions about um, these sorts of issues with um, with senior executives, chief executives and, and uh, investors um, from some places that have not necessarily signed up to initiatives like this one people say well yeah I mean no it's all very well but you know um, I still have, I'm measured by and will be rewarded according to profit and I can't ignore profit and inevitably if there's going to be a conflict between profit and purpose, I just simply cannot ignore profit and pro it really does have to come first. Now, the amendment to the to company's law that's being talked about to create the Better Business Act um, is not obviously saying ignore profit, but what do you do if in you know, a situation like, say, the Financial Times 
might discover that, say, the best way to help the environment would be to stop printing and delivering the newspaper. That's the only way that we could sustainably reduce emissions at scale. Um, but that would put a lot of people out of work. Um, it arguably might not be great for some parts of the business. And there are others, or a whole lot of knock-on effects might be had by that. If this act were law, would it make any difference to the considerations that need to be taken into account to, to decide on something like that? Who'd like to have a go? Anybody? Roger. Uh, no, I, I, I mean, uh, my view is that most good companies are already operating in this way, the way that is encouraged by the Better Business Act, because I think it, you know any good company understands that to be a success, you have to think about your stakeholders. You know, you have to work out who they are. You have to do a, a stakeholder mapping exercise. You have to kind of work out the right engagement strategy for each each type of, of stakeholder and prioritize them depending on your your circumstances. So, and that you know that that's what a good company does. You know, the, the, really what we're trying to discourage are those, are those minority of companies which are still, um, you know, taking, should we say, a very narrow, short-term perspective um, aimed at, um, you know, benefiting shareholders, for example, at the expense of, of, other, of other stakeholders. Um, I think if you have a long-term perspective on your business, generally speaking, your soul going to almost by definition, solve many of these issues, because I think in the long term, if you're taking a long term perspective, the stakeholder interests tend to kind of converge. But where there can be a problem is in the short term. You know, do I take 500 million out of this business and pay myself a dividend? Um, or do I sort of uh, take a longer term perspective, leave that in, invest in other stakeholders, invest in the future of the business um, to achieve long term success, which then ultimately will come back and benefit me as a, as a shareholder but in the short term it's a temptation to to, to just benefit myself so mm -hmm. i think um yeah i feel i feel that most businesses will be doing this anyway and what but what this would take away is that argument around the boardroom that oh you can't take these steps to address climate change you can't you can't actually invest in your stakeholders because you have a fiduciary duty to benefit the shareholders and therefore you have to give them their money back you have to give them a return um, mm. And that can be a particular issue, for example, in a takeover situation. You know, it really it can often clarifies this shareholders versus versus other stakeholders. So I feel yeah. that it's an important symbolic step to say, as far as the law is concerned, do the right thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a, a, a valuable transparency point as well. That like good businesses, good boards should be making decisions like this anyway at any whatever the size of the company is, but like putting this in your governing documents and, you know, on your website to, or, you know, out to your customers and your employees, like you say, I'm holding myself to this standard and that enables um, a new form of transparency, which is a new form of um, uh, accountability, um, which can also, again, only make for like better run companies and, and, and better decisions. So I think mm. that is in addition to the removing the barrier piece um, that Roger talked about, I think that's really powerful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, now we have um, another question here. Do, do send in your questions. We'll be taking them as we go along um, and uh, in, in case they, well, it, whether they're relevant or not actually, but um, uh, rather than leaving them all towards the end, which um, can sometimes uh, not be satisfactory for all involved. But um, there's an interesting one here actually. Um, what do you think of appointing a stakeholder relationship officer to sit at every board meeting um, Erica Sasanto says this idea was suggested at a recent IOD webinar that she went to recently. Um, might have been called the steering wheel of stakeholder agenda. But anyway, it's an interesting idea, a stakeholder relationship officer. Amy, what do you think about that? It's a really interesting, it's a really interesting point. I mean, stakeholder engagement historically has nearly always been the domain of the sustainability officers within businesses um, in terms of, uh, you know, orchestrating a business's response to stakeholder, inward stakeholder inquiries, um, etc. It's not the role of the sustainability officer to necessarily conduct that stakeholder engagement, but it's certainly sat within that sustainability piece. Any one business's stakeholders are very broad and very diverse. It can be geographically spread over vast, you know, vast areas of the globe, depending on the business, um, and will have very, very um, 
discrete and often actually quite unique sets of challenges that they're facing, whether it's the employees, whether it's the local communities, um, et cetera. Um, it has some value, I think, you know, having somebody at the board level responsible for stakeholder engagement and stakeholder representation is absolutely, I think, the way forward. Um, ideally, you want that individual to be C-suite and empowered um, to be able to uh, really represent um, the issues that are being raised and to then have the influence to be able to take action on the issues that are raised. But nothing substitutes giving the stakeholders the actual voice and giving them their own voice um, at board level. Now that doesn't necessarily need to happen through board level position, but it can happen through board, board level presentation as well. And there's, there's, a, there's a really interesting um, you know, conversation around future fit boards. What does the board of tomorrow need to look like? You know, what do we need to have as skills that enable us to really ensure that these businesses are responding to those different stakeholder um, needs and all the risks and the opportunities? And that's the bigger, I think that to me is the bigger conversation is what is a future fit board? What does it look like? Where do we get um, the right level of representation at board level through board membership that actually can then adequately represent those, uh, those different stakeholder needs? And that is through diversity in all forms, socioeconomic, gender, um, age, geography, you name it. You know, mm. the boards that we have today do not reflect the boards that we need to have in place to drive us where we need to get to in the next decade, next 20, next 30 years. Um, so for me, it's, I'm a little bit cautious about kind of having one person represent a range and a very diverse range of stakeholders. I think let's mix up the boards to start with and let's actually work out what a future fit board needs to look like because I'm sorry, but let's face it, the boards that are out there today, most of them aren't future fit um, in terms of the skills and the lived in experience that we need to guide these organizations. And then within that, then let's look at where stakeholder, uh, the stakeholder voice comes in. Yeah, yeah. Um, Alex, um, what would Bulb think about having a stakeholder relationship officer? At, at board level or? At, bo uh... at board level, yeah. Um, we are we're... sitting at every board meeting anyway, was it? Um, we, we, so Bob also has the Bob Foundation that we set up a couple of years ago and that, uh, that, um, that, that look, look, fights the climate crisis on a kind of longer term global scale to our business and that has an employee representation repre representative on it. Um, mm. It's a different uh, kind of, it, it's a different focus, but it's, um, that has worked in that setting has worked really well. Having someone from our, who is a trained, um, what's an energy specialist, one of our member service team who also happens to have like a PhD in, um, like efficiency of, of how homes are run. They get to sit on the board and decide where does that funding go to that, that bulbs, um, that, money from every switch everyone who switches to us one pound goes to this foundation they help make that decision and they connect it in with the employees so we've seen that work really well in that foundation charity trustee model um our like actual board is uh quite small given we're five years old and still a um entrepreneur led company so I, it would be a big shift for us but i think what would be more important for a company of our kind of size and stature is making sure that the stakeholder voice is held, is heard throughout the organization. I actually think that's probably as much at like our exec team level, um, at our, uh, th through how we run, how we set up and design our products than it is at that board level. Because when you're a company like us, that's like moving as fast as we are, like decisions are made at quarterly board. And of course there's good governance there, but decisions are made a lot more um, at a lot faster pace than that as well. Um, yeah. yeah. So I think board governance is like really important, uh, of course. Um, but there's also different models that will work for the size of and scale of your company. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and Roger, I mean, I, you, there's been some interesting research that's come out in the last few months. Um, just to to, uh, to that point about um, the competence of boards and the and the um, uh, suitability of some of the makeup of some boards, um, particularly on climate change and environmental issues, for example. You know, there's a uh, uh, research showing that boards are incredibly climate incompetent 
um, and more over pretty ESG in general incompetent. Um, but I wonder if you think that the, this idea of um, a stakeholder relationship officer is a way of, of addressing that or are there other ways? Yeah, that wouldn't be my favoured way. For, for me, the key point is you, you need to get stakeholder the stakeholder perspective and just that, of course, we're talking about many different types of stakeholders, aren't we? They're not one, just one category of, uh, of, of person. Um, the key is we get this, we get stakeholders perspectives into the boardroom so that it can inform decision making and then the board understands that. I wouldn't necessarily, I mean, um, if you're having someone who's like an observer in the board, that's always difficult because, um, you know, there's a danger that they then become defined as shadow directors, you know, that, um, you know, what is exactly is their status? Um, I think, uh, also, I think understanding stakeholder perspectives is something that the board as a whole needs to, 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 to do. You know, they, they need to take that on board. They need to have knowledge of these, of these topics that, you, that you're talking about. And mm -hmm. I, I fully agree with you. There is a lack of understanding of actually a growing number of topics are on boards because we, we, you know, the traditional profile of a board member was someone who was previously a senior executive or a CEO, often from a finance background um, or maybe some other executive functional background. It was, a, mm. you know, it, the usual suspects, basically, and that they're the people that have gone onto boards. Now, the, there's a whole range of skills now on, on boards, which, you know, where we just don't have the right skills. We don't have the right um, digital skills. We don't have people who really understand cybersecurity, even though that's the, the big, the number one risk that many, many boards face. Mm. They don't really understand ESG. They don't understand cl the climate change and how, that, how that's going to impact their company. Um, so there is a there is a kind of a, there's a real need for us to somehow widen out, you know, even forget all of the stuff to do with trying to create more diversity, you know, gender yeah. diversity, ethnic diversity and all of that, which which is needed. And um, somehow we have to find a way to find new candidates for to, to sit on boards. And mm. how do we do that? I mean, we've got to find bridges, I think, to achieve that. And one of the way one bridge, I think, to bring new more candidates onto boards is you know, um, professional um, qualifications for directors, you know, more of a professional framework, which allows people from, you know, perhaps some slightly unconventional by the standards of boards backgrounds, still very relevant experience, but not the classic executive pathway, to allow them to be able to justify a position on a board. And I think, you know, through professional development qualifications, and I should mention the IOD's own charter director qualification. I'm sorry to, that's not meant yeah. to be advertising, <laughs> but um, it's- uh, Definitely get a plug that, in there. That is the type of thing which is a bridge to yeah. a more diverse group of people to, to, to get onto boards. Yeah, yeah, interesting point. Uh, just before we leave this point, um, Gwyn Jones has just um, made an interesting point here that there's a company called riversimple.com that has created a company on this principle of uh, stakeholder relationship officer, I think, um, and, and it works. Their governance structure and director's responsibilities reflect this legally. And their stakeholder relationship person is called their chair of stewards who can veto board decisions if they fail to create the benefit streams. Well, that's very interesting, I think. Um, I, I didn't know that. Um, but but um, it just leads me on to another point. So um, on the Better Business Act website, it says that uh, a number of something like 40 US states and uh, a number of other countries, Italy, Canada, and amongst others, have actually introduced measures like the Better Business Act. And I just wonder if any of you have looked at that and um, uh, looked at what's happening abroad and whether that, you know, what the, the, there are any lessons that um, could be offered for the UK. Um, Amy, you were nodding there. Mm, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it's really interesting. I think there are over 10,000 benefit corporations now um, spread, as you said, please, between the US, Colombia, Italy, I think Ecuador as well. Um, you know, so we're seeing benefit corporation, which is a, a, a legislative term. We're seeing that come through. I think if we look at France, we look at our, you know, our, our, our friends across the channel, um, and we look in uh, May 2019, they introduced a voluntary measure, legislative measure called the Entreprise à Mission, the Société à Mission, um, which is a little bit like a benefit corporation. It's effectively a purpose driven organization that's bedded down in, in, in law. Um, Danon at last year's AGM got around, I've totally forgot, I think it was something like 98.7% of their shareholders 
voted for them to become an entreprise à mission. What's been really, really interesting since uh, the end of last year, I think in France there were 124 entreprises à mission in the time to May the 31st, are there 31 days in May? End of May. Um, the end of May this year, there were 174, I think it was. There's been a 42% increase. And that's an exponential increase in a very, very short period of time. Mm. Um, now that's a voluntary measure. So that's mm. not mandating that you have to do this. That's a voluntary measure. And getting that level of support and uptake for a voluntary measure um, bodes well, I think, for a more mandated approach to company law um, mm. as well. So, you know, there are some really interesting lessons that we can learn around the receptivity to these types of legislative changes that are out there. Yeah. Um, but I mean, you, you mentioned Danone and, and, um, and they did in fact lose their chief executive, mm -hmm. who was an extraordinarily um, strong proponent of the B Corp um, system. And, um, you know, it, it, although um, the people uh, who were essentially responsible for that said that they didn't necessarily want to move away from it internally. Um, there was a sense that maybe mm. the push had gone a bit too far. I mean, does that worry you? Um, I mean, of course, it, it, it worries any investor who may have taken a position in a company from purpose perspective, recognising that it is about long term growth potential with that company. Um, I think uh, Emmanuel Faber in your in your own paper. Uh, responded to what had happened um, and confirmed that it was less about the purpose that had been embedded down in the business and more about, um, I think, some uh, power plays. I think that's <laughs> kind of taking taking some of the language. Um, I think it was more about that. When, as an investor, when you're looking at a company, you're never looking at one person, Polita. You're looking at the the the. The, the, the management structure, the policies, the processes that have been put in place across the business that embed that sense of purpose. So we would never invest in a business because of one individual, however charismatic they may be right. at the top of, you know, at the top of that business, who's, who's effectively responsible for the strategic direction of that business and delivering on that. We would, we would never do that. Um, but of course it is worrying when you have a purpose driven organization that is trying to transition to future fitness that attracts, you know, potentially some slightly unwanted attention, um, in the market, you know, that, that is a worry, but I think, you know, there was a reaction to that, that, um, uh, situation with Danone and, and a real concern that it was about the purpose. I think, you know, with Emmanuel Faber's response in the FT, the letter in the FT, I think that possibly, hopefully, um, uh, relaxed a few of the investors who ho hopefully were in Danone from a, from a purpose point right. of view. Yeah, um, yeah. So I think, I think, yeah, I mean, ultimately, of course, it's going to be worrying, but I would always hope that as an investor, you've never taken in a position in a company because of one person. Yeah, yeah. Um, Alex and Roger, any, any other thoughts from, um, from you about the uh, similar measures overseas and whether they have any lessons for the UK? Uh, well, certainly um, the, 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 there's been a lot of this in the US um, where they've had a, the benefit corporation and the US is like uh, historically a more state uh, shareholder activist um, set up than the UK and then our European counterparts. So it was a big move. Um, to set that up in the US and more mm. controversial, I think, than, than you might see in European countries where arguably like stakeholder capitalism and, and often family run companies, you know, exist, there's just more of them than there are in Anglo markets. Um, so that is like quite powerful in itself. I think that if it survives and thrives in, in that, um, that market, then that's a, that's a powerful symbol. Um, I think there's something we can learn from the UK as well. Um, the UK has, uh, has a number of corporate forms. Um, one that some people will be aware of was like a community interest company that was set up, that was, is kind of a hybrid between a, well, a, a profit and purpose driven organization, um, which hasn't really worked uh, in the way I think it was intended to um, partly because it was it, it has certain cat it goes back to your initial question on does it have to be profit versus purpose um, the kick 
I don't want to get into the details of it, but it has some, it has some elements of it that would, would encourage thinking like that. And it's really challenging for investors um, then. So, so I think putting this kind of change in the heart of company law, you know, standard everyday company law is, is a really powerful um, and smart move as well. Yeah. Yeah. And Roger, uh, any thoughts from you on this? Yes, I think, you know, the biggest example of where you have a different approach in company law is in continental Europe. Um, mm. You know, in countries like Germany, the Netherlands, the, the Nordic countries. I mean, in those countries, of course, you have the stakeholder perspective um, sort of embedded in a very direct way, you know, through having worker representative, employee representative sitting on sitting on boards or on the supervisory board, for example, as, as in Germany. But also it's clear in company law and in the corporate governance codes they have in those countries that the board has to take a, a much more of a balanced um, stakeholder perspective, which thinks about, you know, a, a larger number of, of, of stakeholders. And I think, you know, for me, a real kind of case which epitomised all this struggle was actually um, Unilever, the case of Unilever, which you may remember, you know, historically Unilever has been a very progressive company actually, you know, and has won, especially under Paul Polman's leadership, you know, has won a lot of plaudits for trying to be seen as a, an example of responsible capitalism. Um, but then all of a sudden it came under attack from, you know, a hostile attack from Kraft of the United States um, so supported by, was it 4G Capital? I think that this uh, hedge fund, um, mm. which really was saying, look, you've been wasting a lot of money on all of this, these frills, all this out, this corporate altruism. It's time to get back to basics, yeah. um, cut your costs, rationalize, produce a financial return for shareholders. Now, to their credit, the investment community um, said, look, we're not going to accept this hostile bit. You know, we're going to stick with you, the existing um, board of, of Unilever. And so that, that was sort of fought off, although I think it really did unsettle them. One mm -hmm. of the steps they then decided to take was to shift their listing location to the Netherlands, because yeah. the Netherlands, of course, offers more protection from hostile takeover bids. They, in the end, they weren't able to do that because their UK shareholders wouldn't allow them to shift their listing because they were concerned that Unilever was going to fall out of the, the FTSE UK indices. So yeah. they, they didn't allow it to happen. But that, to me, that whole circumstance was a case study of how within the current framework, you know, if you are trying, to, if you're trying to um, pursue quite a responsible stakeholder orientation, but because of the inherent shareholder bias of the current setup, that can be derailed at any point. You just have to have some shareholder oriented hedge fund come in, take, you know, activist, launch an activist campaign, take a position in your company, and then, mm. you know, really then try and push you back into a shareholder orientation. But, but would a better business act have changed any, anything about that, that moment in Unilever's history? I mean, would uh, it, Yes, it would have started the process because, you know, as we said before, share, regardless of the Companies Act duties, um, shareholders still hold some very significant powers. And, you know, with the, uh, the most important of which is they can vote on or off members of the board of directors, you know, so mm. that is, that's at the heart of any share, activist shareholder campaign, either getting more than 50% or forming alliances with other shareholders to, to give them significant control. You know, so that you'd need, to, if you were genuinely to move, going to move to a stakeholder approach, you would have to also look at things like that as well. Yeah. I, think, I was yeah. going to say, Polita as well, I think what's really, really interesting is that we, we forget about the rule of law and the role of law. And we've just seen that played out in a district court in um, Holland with Shell. Mm. Um, and this grow, you know, the growing um, cases of climate litigation around the world, citing human rights. Mm. as effectively the, the platform upon which they're holding these companies to account. And what's interesting with that Shell case is that the shareholders had agreed to Shell's energy transition plan, you know, a week, 10 days beforehand. Um, and it was the district court in Holland who then ruled that that was, you know, that the energy transition plan was not enough. It was in breach of effectively its obligations under the, you know, the, the, the international, sorry, under human rights law yeah. to, to move further and faster and cut deeper. 
So mm. the court didn't just disagree with um, Shell, it disagreed with the shareholders. And it mm. kind of, it sends the message out there that nobody, including the shareholders, is beyond the rule of law, especially when it relates to human rights. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a really interesting point. A um, couple of other interesting points coming through in the comments here. Um, Michael Smith saying Unilever would still be better as a B Corp. Uh, <laughs> They have quite a few B Corps, Michael. They are, they do have, you know, they've got Ben and Jerry's seventh generation. So there is a transition journey, I think, underway at Unilever. Um, and a, another great comment here, considering that the makeup of many boards today um, are, are like 1980s Gordon Gecko, Greek, good generation people, isn't it going to be incredibly difficult to genuinely shift this mentality? In fact, isn't it only really going to happen when people leave or retire, or resign or fire? That's the only time anything's going to be changed. I mean, a gloomy but possibly incredibly correct comment there what do you think alex well i think all these things are like you know what's that famous line how did you become bankrupt gradually then suddenly like i think that's what this is like it's gradual sure um but i also think it's just coming and as, on a personal note I, I i said before we set up this call like i know amy from my previous role in the cabinet office um where my team's job was to build a, an impact investment market in the UK. And I led some work um, working with uh, uh, Nigel Wilson from Legal and General on a mission-led business review in government and how can we create and foster more mission-led businesses. And it was really hard to, to get um, inside government. That was a really tricky thing um, that we were pushing, that our like civil servant team was pushing for working with other teams. Um, and Four years later, like here we are with an act that's that's led, um, that's in parliament, that's got a number, like a large number of companies behind it. It's got MPs from different sides behind it. It's got the IOD. I mean, I did meet with people from the IOD years ago and it was it was not, not as senior as you, Roger, I'll tell you that. Um, so, <laughs> so like, I, think, like, I, I, I hear you, Dion, but I also think that like this change is coming and it'll come quicker than we anticipate. Yeah, that's that's um, that's really interesting. Um, uh, another question. Yeah. Lisa, Lisa, can I just add just add something? It's a shameless plug, just on what Alex just said. There are over five hundred B Corps in the UK, which means there are over at least five hundred quality directors out there available for board service. Good point. <laughs> Good point. Um, yes, well, that, that is that is a really interesting point, actually. And and I mean, Alex, to your point, you know, if you were trying to undergo that, try, trying to um, uh, go through that exercise today, it'd be entirely different, right? Yeah, I mean, certainly, like the yeah, you, you know, who does who do who, the, if if government wants to make a corporate governance decision, the yeah. organisations they pull into that room are, are IOD are they, and and CBI yeah. and others like that. So yeah, of course. We'll um, and I, I just wonder. Um, you know, we've seen this, I think, a, a really quite um, astonishingly large emphasis on ESG issues of all sorts um, during the pandemic. Um, and I, it's, in a way, it's been quite surprising because I think at the start of the crisis last year, there were a lot of people, in fact, I remember Michael O'Leary from Ryanair appearing at um, a very large FT conference and saying, you know, I'm, you know it's really, so, I'm really sad to say that the EU's focus on environmental issues in particular is just going to have to take a back seat now because we're all going to be worried about jobs, 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 and then we're going to be worrying about the enormous debt that's going to pile up as governments try to <laughs> deal with this crisis. And actually, um, you know, that's not the case at all, really. You know, I mean, governments, companies, everybody has really um, grasped this agenda and arguably business more than governments. And I just wondered... What do you think is going to happen as the pandemic eases, which eventually it will, um, uh, one hopes. Um, but what do you think is going to happen? Do you think that, that that focus is going to slide with it or not? You think yes, no, because yeah. COVID is one crisis and we're surrounded by cascading crises at the moment. And you've only got to look to a tiny little town in uh, British Columbia in Canada that reached 49.6 degrees and is now on fire. Um, it's 48 degrees, it has been 48 degrees in the Arctic Circle in Siberia. You know, we are surrounded, we've got biodiversity crisis, we've got a crisis of racial um, equity and equality, we've got a crisis of broader inequality. We are surrounded by cascading crises and we, 
may hopefully be coming out of COVID um, into a new, new normal. It's not the old normal, it's a new normal, but that new normal is a very, very, very different world um, than it was 18 months ago, given how much acceleration we're seeing in these you know, key social and environmental issues that we're facing. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to sound like a, a doomsday merchant, but you know, we're coming out of one crisis and we're still in the crises that we were in before yeah. COVID and they have just got worse. Yeah, yeah the, the, I would I totally agree with Amy. The climate crisis is not going away. And so, something Bob's involved in, um, we've spearheaded, it's something called Tech Zero, which is a coalition of tech companies that are committed to net zero. It's got commitments around it and measure your carbon emissions and transparency and make a plan, not just set a target. Um, but that's, we soft launched that a couple of months ago and did a more formal launch two weeks ago. It's already kind of grown from 15 to 75 members in that like two month period um mm. there's like a lot of interest uh, ambition appetite amongst businesses to address these these crises i don't think that's going to go away um because because covid hopefully goes away yeah yeah I, I really agree with you um both of you i mean it, something has fundamentally changed hasn't it you know the, people's attitude to this to this topic i mean mm. you know it's amazing actually how investors attitudes towards um, you no know, climate change have, have just changed. I mean, in theory, you would think it's strange, isn't it? Why are in investors, shareholders, actually speaking up in favour of stakeholder interests? I mean, surely they should be speaking up in, in favour of shareholder interests. You know, that, that's their own interest. But yet many of them are not. And of course, the reason they are saying that is because their own clients, you know, the people who are investing in pension funds, pension fund trustees and, and savers, are putting pressure on them to actually, you know, take an interest in these issues and, and, and campaign on these issues. So they are getting pressure from, from society. So, and, you know, the governments, even the government, the conservative government now, um, you know, we, I, I was very lucky to, along with the Better Business Act campaign team, to go and actually and talk to the business secretary of, um, about a month ago about the Better Business Act. And that would have been inconceivable, you know, but three or four, Four years ago, you know, for a conservative government to even think about the better something like the Better Business Act would have been inconceivable. But now, um, I don't know, you know, I can't tell you whether they're going to actually go ahead with it, you know, anytime soon. But certainly, it's something that is of um, of, 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 it, of great interest to them. But what sort of response did you get? I think I think um, well, you know, the business secretary but he agreed that this it was aligned with a lot of the other things that the, the, this current government is trying to do, you know, particularly mm. in respect of net zero and, and, and so on. I suppose the, the issue is, is, is this going to be, given all the other stuff that's going on, is this going to be a legislative priority, you know, in the next parliament? Um, I, 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 that, I, that, the answer to that I, is that I don't know. But yeah. certainly in terms of, you know, um, understanding where this is coming from and recognising that this was a, a valid you know, avenue to explore and a, and a valid argument. Absolutely, there was buy into that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we are getting dangerously close to being out of time. Um, I'm aware I haven't. I, there's uh, what have I? There, well, there was there were a few points and questions here that we haven't managed to get to. But I, I'm so interested just to hear what the government is uh, is likely to do about this because as, as we know um, the Better Business Act hasn't made it onto the current agenda um, and it's a very crowded agenda and you know one does wonder if it needs to get a little less crowded before it's going to be possible for this to uh, to squeeze on but but as you say I mean you know having the business secretary um, sitting down and talking about this isn't necessarily something that would have happened you know four or even three two years ago possibly. Um, yeah. um, so I think that is really interesting and I mean I just perhaps we could just end if you could each of you just really quickly for all the people watching if there's one thing that they could do um, in order to support this act um, what do you think it what's needed in your view Amy um, we need the investment community to come alongside um, in much more force than it currently has so for everybody listening to this um, write to your bank if you work with an investment manager, speak to your investment manager. If you have a pension, speak to your pension provider. Get them to come alongside. We need the investment community. Apart from anything else, it is a fantastic 
mechanism that will ultimately help them increase their own resilience in this new constrained world that we live in. We need them to step up and lean in far more than they currently have. Everybody has a relationship with a financier at some stage in their life. Um, right. So encourage them to step up and, and lean in as much as you encourage your local MP to step up and lean in as well. Yeah, yeah. Alex, what, what would your... I mean, what we would obviously say that businesses like large and small need to get behind this. They can go to the, the I think it's just been shared in the chat, the kind of Better Business Act and, and sign up there. Um, but it, I know Conduit has, would have a lot of entrepreneurs in this, in this audience, but, um, but even beyond that, we're all consumers. So you can also write to companies. And in the other part of my job on regulation, I, I certainly see some of the contacts we get from people and we have from, from our members and we have to pay attention to them. So, you know, it's important, yeah. another little form of advocacy. Great point. And Roger, yeah. And, uh, you know, I think um, uh, just to, to, to reinforce what Alex said, you know, let's get businesses to sign up to, 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 the, to the campaign. We don't have to just sign up you know, multinational companies. I mean, the smallest business can sign up. So, you know, if you're part of a business or you know of a business which you, you feel is inherently going to be sympathetic to the, the sort of objectives that, that this, is, this is calling for, get them to sign up. It's very easy. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Well, it is seven o'clock on the dot, and I suspect quite a few people watching will be thinking about having a glass of something or um, a bite of something. I know I certainly am. So, um, but thank you all so much for a really interesting discussion. Um, super, super great. And uh, uh, just, I, I'm going to be fascinated to see um, where this campaign gets to because I have to say you know it's gone from a standing start uh, just at the end of March uh, it's achieved a huge amount uh, the Financial Times has even mentioned it and covered it in a story so um, uh, so it's clearly clearly breaking through um, but uh, and as of many others in fact so um, uh, best of luck to all of you thank you very much thanks for all the great questions and comments from the audience as well and uh, let's hope that we can come back in maybe um, a year's time and uh, things might have moved on Thanks very much.